it's kind of funny, you had two organizations fighting it out, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Army. Neither of them have any women. And they have, couldn't care less about young people. All the people in the guidance bureau of the of the uh, you know of the Muslim Brotherhood are like 70, 65 or older, all men. And everybody in the leadership of the you know the army is all men. And the young people are just conscripts, a cannon fodder, you know. Very excited to have Peter Hessler here this night. A staff writer for the New Yorker and a contributing writer for National Geographic. His subjects have included archaeology in both China and Egypt a factory worker in Shenzhen, a garbage collector in Cairo, a small town druggist in rural Colorado, and Chinese lingerie dealers in, the upper, in upper Egypt. You may all be also, also be familiar with his books, three of which form a trilogy about the decade he spent in China, River Town, Oracle Bones, and Country Driving. He has been awarded the Kiriyama Book Prize and a National Magazine Award, and has been a finalist for the National Book Award, and has been recognized with the MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. Tonight, he'll be in conversation with Matthew Bell. Matthew is a correspondent for the world and has reported from Egypt, Hong Kong, Europe, and many other places around the world. He currently covers breaking news on U.S. foreign policy and national security, as well as reporting on religion, the Middle East, and Asia. Thanks for coming. Um, where to start? Uh, I'm Matthew Bell. I work at Public Radio International News Program. Um, Pete and I met in 1999 when I was working out at KQED in San Francisco. And I worked for a show about Asia and Asian Americans called Pacific Time. It was on the air for uh, six, seven years or something. And uh, we were just getting going, and someone came across this book, Rivertown, Pete's first book, and said sort of dismissively out oh, some guy that was on Peace Corps in China. Uh, and then we flipped open the book and started reading it and said, we need to get this guy in and talk to him and put him on the radio, because it was such a good book. Um, and then we, I spent some time reporting in Egypt and we reconnected there. Um, we were there for the first election after the revolution. We were, remember, going to the polling lines. Happy the, time. Yeah, yeah, that was when things looked good. Um, I think you counted, you mentioned in the book that you actually were counting the, the women in one line. Mm -hmm. And it was like 1,200 women or something. Um, but I think we'll, we'll let's start, we'll, I'll try to ask like some big picture questions about some of the big themes that he gets to in the book, and then we'll open up for questions at the end, but maybe start at the beginning of this project. Um, how did you guys pick Egypt? Yeah, I mean this, you know, it was sort of a long range thing, and it was you guys, it wasn't my decision. Uh, you know, I, I went there with my wife, Leslie, who was also a writer, Leslie Chang, she wrote a book called Factory Girls. Uh, about uh, women workers in, in China. Um, both of us lived in China for more than a decade. Uh, I was first in the Peace Corps and then of course as a journalist, and Leslie was a journalist all the way through. So around 2007 we decided that we wanted to leave, and, and to be honest, it, it, it wasn't because of being tired of China or finding that the place had no challenge or, or anything like that. I mean, I, I felt like I could have continued doing that forever in some sense, but I was a little concerned about being pegged um, as just a certain type of writer, writing about China, both by readers or by editors or even by myself. Um, and I also just felt like I wanted to learn something new, go to a new part of the world, just undertake a new challenge. And Leslie had the same instinct and we felt like we had enough energy. Um, at the time, we felt like we were young enough to do it. We didn't have any kids, which made all this seem very abstract and easy. Um, and so, I guess there's, a, there's even a part in the book I can read, maybe a couple of lines here early on where I'd sort of describe our thinking. We did, we went through a lot of different possible places to go to, like we thought about going to India, a lot of people were doing that from China, and in some ways that was somewhat discouraging because I felt like there's too much India-China comparison and, and maybe it would be useful to go somewhere sort of farther afield. Also the language, we both wanted to study uh, a rich, difficult language like Chinese, and, and in India a lot of people get by in English, and there isn't one language that you learn. Um, so anyway, and at the same time we were thinking about having a kid. Um, so I'll read this from the, from the second chapter. We made a plan. We would move to rural southwestern Colorado as a break from urban life, and we hoped to have a child. Then we would go to live in the Middle East. We liked the idea of going to a place that was completely unfamiliar, and both of us wanted to study another rich language. I looked forward to visiting Middle Eastern archaeological sites because in China, I had always been fascinated by the deep time of such places. All of it was abstract, the kid, the country. Maybe we go to Egypt or maybe Syria. 
maybe a boy, maybe a girl. What difference did it make? When I mentioned moving to Egypt, an editor in New York warned me that the place might seem too sluggish after China. Nothing changes in Cairo, he said. But I like the sound of that. I looked forward to studying Arabic at a relaxed pace in a country where nothing happened. So this, was, this was sort of like, I mean, it tells you sort of the weakness of plans. Um, because basically, two things happened. The first was this. Um, we had two babies instead of one. We had twin daughters that were born in 2010, and then we started to, to get ready to go to Egypt and, uh, or, or Damascus, actually, we're thinking of, and then Arab Spring started. Um, and so pretty quickly we realized that Damascus was not going to work. Actually, and at that point, there was not a war in Syria. Syria was, the reason we couldn't go, as you will remember, was basically because we, 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 the journalist wasn't going to be able to live there full time. You were talking about applying not allowed. visas. Yeah. yeah, we weren't allowed. Yeah, so, so Syria was off the table, not because at all, because of violence. Actually, at Cairo seemed more violent at that time. Um, and so we ended up going to Cairo. That was how we made that decision. So what? talk about the your fascination with uh, Arabic. Evidently, Chinese wasn't difficult enough for you. <laughs> so you wanted to find another difficult language. I have enough experience with both languages, and I'm bad enough at you both studied, to know uh, you it Chinese was difficult. Or? Chinese history, and then I picked up Chinese language later. Okay. I speak it very poorly. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, in Edmund, I didn't actually study languages in, in college. I mean, I, you know, so my Chinese was learned from the time I was 27, but it, I was put in a place in the Peace Corps, a very intense situation where you could learn very quickly. Um, so my Chinese was quite fluent. Um, and I, we knew that we couldn't learn Arabic the way we had learned Chinese, and, and Leslie grew up speaking Chinese. Um, so it was her, actually her first language. Um, uh, but we both liked the idea of just taking on this kind of challenge, and it seemed like such a rich, beautiful language, and I've always, I liked writing about language in Rivertown. I wrote a lot about the process of learning Chinese. I, mean, I think everybody has this idea you should learn languages when you're a kid, um, otherwise it's too late. And to some degree that's true, maybe. I mean, you can still get plenty good as an adult, though. And the other thing about it is you appreciate the process more as an adult, and you notice things more. You know, as a kid, it just, it just pours into you, and you're not really picking up. I mean, it was great for me to see the difference of my, like, the textbooks that we use to study Egyptian Arabic versus the textbooks we used to study Chinese. And I have, there are sections in the book where I discuss this. Because in the Chinese, first of all, there was never anything negative about China. All positive. And it was all very, you know, straight the great history. And, and it was all very political. You know, you had, of course, it was a state-run publishing house. And it was, you know, they, just, they, they taught you the terms for different bureaus and government bureaus and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, very, you know, state-centered, basically. Um, and then you pick up the Egyptian book, and it's all families bickering and fighting and treating each other in complicated ways. <laughs> it's sort of like, and it has like, you know, the dialogues there in China, there'd be like, you know, a student and a teacher talking about a, a uh, you know, the Yangtze River and how great it is or something. And in Egypt, it would be like a wrong number call where somebody's like calling and being incredibly persistent on the phone about a wrong number, which actually happens all the time in Egypt. And we, <laughs> and we didn't kind of realize this until we got this. Actually, I think maybe I'll read that one. That's, it's, 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 it was totally bizarre. Our first trip to Egypt, I worked with um, Magdi, someone that we both know who's an interpreter and, and a fixer, someone that you hire as a journalist to work there. And he said, you know, in, in Egypt, when you, someone calls and you don't recognize the number, you can't answer it because it could be state security and it's just better to just not answer the phone and you, you can avoid the headache. Yeah, no, this was the one that was in our textbook. So this is very early in the textbook and it has this dialogue, a dialogue between a guy named Ali and a guy named Hamis and, it's, and Ali says, hello. And Hamis says, hello, is Mr. Guma there? Ali, no, wrong number. Hamis, yes, how? I want Mr. Guma. Ali, ya Habibi, there is nobody here called Mr. Guma. Hamis, I'm Hamis, he knows me. Ali, again, wrong number, goodbye. Hamis, fine, but he knows who I am. Ali, goodbye. And, and then, so this to me was a totally bizarre thing, and I just thought it was a stupid thing in the book. And then we start talking with our teacher, Sammy, and he's like, I think Mr. Guma is actually there. <laughs> he had all these reasons why 
by Mr. Kuma, you know, he was like reading the subtext to this thing, you know, like this is, you know, it's like hills like white elephant, and they're talking about something that nobody's mentioning. Um, he's like, you know, perhaps Mr. Kuma owes him money, or maybe he's asking for a favor, and, and he's like, yes, in Egypt, sometimes we, we hide what people want, you know, all these, you know, incredibly complex interpretations. And so that sort of thing I find is the great part of learning language as an adult, you appreciate this stuff. And, and it was a really fascinating contrast with China. And there were, you know, contrasts with China sort of do run throughout different sections of the book because another reason we wanted to go to a place like this is we knew that our perspective was not just as Westerners, but also to some degree the, the, the Chinese perspective. Of course, my wife does too, more than me. Um, but it just, it does color what you see and the way you interpret things. So one, one thing about Chinese is that there are many dialects all over the country, you go to different places and, and Chinese sounds different or it's mm -hmm. completely different, but almost everyone can read the same newspapers. Mm -hmm. Almost everyone can read mm -hmm. the same books. Um, there's some of that going on in the Arab world, but it's also it's so diverse. I remember I studied Arabic in Jerusalem and my first trip to Egypt, I thought I was doing well and getting up to speed, I started speaking Arabic to people and they were like, what language are you speaking? <laughs> because it was Palestinian conversational Arabic. So what did what did you decide to to focus on? Spoken yeah. Egyptian? This is or? A bit, it's a complicated. It's actually for people who are familiar with China, it's a little like the situation when you had classical Chinese Wang Wen, um, the you know which is before the, the early nineteen in the early nineteen hundreds they changed the system, but up until then Chinese did not write in the quote very often. They wrote in the classical which was basically sort of a form of the language from around the Han Dynasty, but actually it may have never been spoken in everyday life. And many cultures had, had this. Greek had it, um, Turk, it, Turkish, you know, where you're writing in a literary language that is not really spoken. And Arabic still does, actually. I mean, most of the writing is in what they call Fusha, which is the formal Arabic, classical Arabic, and nobody can actually speak Fusha. I mean, it's, it's not really possible to speak it spontaneously. Like, you know, even if you're a linguist, they cannot have, you know, spontaneously give a 10 minute talk without making a ton of grammatical mistakes. I mean, it's really, it's, it's and this because it was probably nobody's daily language. It's a very odd situation. I, I, I talk about it in the book. I think that it probably has something to do with literacy, with the problem of literacy. I mean, there's lots of other reasons for this too. But Egypt does have a very low rate of literacy. It's about, you know, about 25% of the population can't read. Um, and a lot of other people don't read very much and don't take, they find it difficult. And I would have to think that not using the, a colloquial form of the language contributes to this. You know? Did you get good at speaking sort of Egyptian colloquial, which people all over the Arab world yeah. will understand because of movies? Right, right. So we did Fusha, which is classical Arabic, only in Middlebury for two months. Um, before leaving the States. Because when we made this decision and we saw what was going on, we had these babies, we decided we really need to do an intensive course. I don't know if you know the Middlebury program where you have to go and they make you pledge that you're not going to speak another language. And they would never had a couple with small children do this. <laughs> and they told us later that we didn't think you'd last a week. And we almost did, unless they wanted to go after a day. <laughs> because it was like five, six hours in class and then five hours of homework. And we had two, they were how old, they were just like a one year old. Uh, through two one-year-olds, and, and it was it was awful. I mean, it was so hard. Um, and then people would sometimes ask us, so are you speaking Arabic with your wife at home? I was like, I'm caring for two one-year-old babies. I'm not going to talk a language that I've been speaking for two weeks with my wife. <laughs> are you crazy? You know, but this is like... But you're supposed to take a language pledge. Yeah, this pledge is like, you know, it's like the Muslim Brotherhood or something. And these are all like college, these are all college kids. I take it really seriously. I was like, I just can't do this. Like, it's not, I'm doing this. I, I was studying language for very pragmatic reasons, and we got funding to go here. <laughs> Believe me, I'm going to speak English with my wife. Although when we were out on the campus, we would speak Chinese. So that then people thought we were students in another program, because <laughs> otherwise they would chew us out for speaking English. So, I mean, I had no respect for the language But anyway, so we got to, once we got to, uh, to Cairo, we switched to studying just Egyptian colloquial. And this was partly a matter of triage, because we knew that we had so much sort of pressure on us from this, from the revolution, from having two small children and being in this new place, and we're in our 40s that we really, our priority was to speak to people and learning classical Arabic was not something we needed to do. We weren't gonna be studying the Quran. Um, so we just learned, yeah, that's all I did was, was Egyptian Arabic, which is great. It's a really fun language. It has a lot of, you know, there's there's words that are from Turkish that are in there a lot from the Ottoman, 
you know, influence. There's a lot of French words, there's various English words. Um, there's some phronic stuff that, that has stayed in the language. You know, a lot, it's interesting what stays in, like a lot of words related to the Nile and to the flood and to the agriculture would be phronic. You know, it's, it's, you get a sense of this foundation of the country still is there. Yeah, it was, so it was great, it was a great experience. So let's talk about, about politics, about the revolution. Um, I got there, my first trip was January 28th when the protesters finally took the, took Tahrir Square and held on to it and never forget, you know, the people I met and just being in the street and, and just seeing massive numbers of all kinds of different people out risking everything to, yeah. to topple the regime. And 18 years later, Mubarak mm -hmm. falls. What were your first impressions when you were first there and learning about what was happening? Yeah, so we, you know, I watched that on TV in Colorado. Um, wondering what we're going to you know, get ourselves into. Um, and by the time we came there, it was during a quiet period. We moved in there in, in October of 2011. Mubarak fell in, in February of that year. But it started up again pretty quickly. In November, there were the, sort of the big second round of protests, the ones you referred to earlier, Mohammed Mahmoud. Um, so very quickly, I was out on the square trying to you know, cover it. Um, and. Uh, I mean, the impressions you would get there. You know, it was just, it was overwhelming. Often you would be dealing with tear gas and things like this. I mean, this was, you know, from one day when they had launched tear gas into the crowd. And so, you know, it was scary. Um, and when I first, it was so overwhelming, the first piece that I did there is one of the early chapters of my book, that mosque was on the square. And I, has, I was talking to somebody and the prayer call sounded and he took me into the mosque. He said, do you want to, I'm going to go pray, do you want to come with me? I said, well, I'm not Muslim. He said, it's fine, you, you know, anybody can come, which I hadn't realized was actually true. And, and so I went in and watched him pray and others, and while they were praying, uh, uh, somebody stole a cell phone that was plugged into a wall and, and he was caught. And so I watched how the people in the mosque handled this while these protests were going outside. And after that experience, I decided the square was just too overwhelming to me, but if maybe I'll go to the mosque every day and just see what kind of community is there, because it had become sort of the seat of justice, and they were also like medical clinics had been set up there. It was like a little community, um, which is often my instinct as a reporter to try to find little communities or places or individuals that I can get to know well. You know, the square was too overwhelming, and all these political dynamics were just too confusing, especially at the start. Um, and so that was really my first political project, was to start very small. And so it really was about the politics in this mosque. But it said something about the larger politics. And it turned out it was, I mean, because what I observed there was this thing broke down in the course of a week. They started with some kind of organization in the mosque, and people were trying to dispense justice in a reasonable way. And by the end of seven, 10 days, they were just beating people up, and there were incredible amounts of theft, and it had just become really chaotic. And it kind of gave me a very dark initial impression of the revolution. I remember early on thinking, being so impressed with a lot of the protesters and a lot of these liberal um, people that were kind of at the forefront of the protests and just being amazed at their bravery and their kind of understanding of Egyptian politics but also global politics. And uh, thinking nothing's going to stop these people. They're, you know, they're going to win. But that absolutely wasn't the case when the voting started, when when things started to play out. How were you surprised too by, you know, when the elections began, when the Brotherhood started to become a real political force? Was that a surprise? I mean, you know, my impressions were mixed because you know that that event I watched, and it, it made me wary. I thought, you know, this uh, I, this has a bad feel to it. I, you know, I, I feel like there's not enough system here. There's not enough organization. But then, of course, the election that you and I covered was sort of amazing. I mean, people, I counted 1,200 women waiting in a line to vote, you know, who had never voted in a free election in their lives. And and they were waiting there for hours, you know, and the, the voter turnout was, I don't know, 70% or something. Happy, optimistic. Yeah, and it there was, was no fraud, yeah. you know. So I had these, you know, I realized these two things are going on, and if you can't really tell at that point, but you did see these things play out. And in the end, I felt like there was a real, the lack of system and the lack of governance 
itself, people had, were not accustomed to structures. You know, it's kind of like the Arabic book I had, which had the Chinese book is full of, you learn the, the Women's Congress and the National People's Congress, Women's Federation, all these different terms. None of that was in the Arabic book because mm -hmm. those things are not important to people. Um, they weren't part of their lives. Most, you know, the government there, even though it's authoritarian, had actually been pretty weak in terms of its impact on people's lives. And I think the same thing with those protesters who were very impressive, they never really organized. You know, they didn't have leaders. Um, and in some ways it's a, it's, it's a sign of the age. We have the same thing now in, in, the, you know, in the United States. If you have like the Tea Party, who was the leader? If you have Black Lives Matter, if you, you, know, if, if you have Occupy. I mean, there's, it, it's partly in the age of internet, it's easy to build, to ramp up a movement. But you don't necessarily have leadership, and and I I think you know that is something that you know to think about seriously. Basically, I think there are costs to that in any in any side of the, of the political spectrum. So the Muslim Brotherhood had leadership, right? They had deep support throughout the country. I remember the first Muslim Brotherhood sponsored um, protest I went to in Tahrir Square, and it was like, boom, there were I don't know how many people that it felt like over 500,000 people just, you know, appeared in one morning on a Friday. Um, what is the Muslim Brotherhood, and, and you write a lot about them in, in the book, you have several characters, you spend some time talking to the leaders. Um, yeah, they, they were a very difficult organization to describe and to get to, to understand. Um, one thing, they were quite deceptive, very wary of outsiders. Uh, you know, this is a group that had been traumatized by years and years of repression and that had really shaped their culture, and it was hard to communicate with them as a result. They, they would tell you what you wanted to hear. Um, but you know, I think the way to look at it, it, you know, it started in the 1920s in a period of anti-colonialist movement in, in Egypt, um, and it's a reaction against colonialism. It's, it was a reaction against some of the forces of modernity, some of the changes that were happening in Egyptian society. So it's sort of, you know, it's of the time that, that communism rose and fascism and other, you know, other big movements that were in reaction to this, especially in traditional society. So that really has more to do with that, I think, than it does with, like, the Islamic faith. I mean, they would always tell you, everything you need to know about us is in the book. Read the Quran. That's all it is in the Quran. And it's like, it's the same thing as, like, if you're talking to an evangelical here and they say, oh, yeah, everything that we believe is in the New Testament. And it's, you know, it's not there, right? I mean, the, the <laughs> groups are, they are a product of their, of their historical moment, their time and their place. And so the Brotherhood, I think, has to be looked at like that. And, and to some degree, separated a bit from Islam, which they, they were not, they don't want it to be separated from that. But I think you have to think about what else was happening in 1920. And they structures, so that structure that they created was a cell structure. It's very, it was basically based on the early Marxist structures and, you know, revolutionaries and, and fascists and, and so on. But, you know, it was a very good revolutionary type of structure that they had. But they were very secretive about their numbers, and I came to realize that they were exaggerating them dramatically. Um, and so I actually think their support was never very deep. I think it was very shallow. Um, and they won those early elections because of lack of competition, not because of deep support. And so once they won, and they're performance didn't impress people, their support disappeared immediately. And they didn't know it. They didn't understand that. And so they didn't feel that society was turning on them. You could, but I really, you, know, you could feel that in the street talking to people. The fall came fast, and it was violent. Mm -hmm. um, you went out and covered some of that. Tell us about the, about the crackdown. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the coup itself happened in 2013. Um, and, you know, that was actually, there was violence all the way up to it, but not the widespread. The widespread violence happened later that year where the massacres in Cairo were, you know, more than a thousand people were killed at two protest sites. And most of them were unarmed. You know, it was probably the worst case of violence in a world capital by the authorities since Tiananmen Square in 1989. And it was a really, you know, shocking, awful event. Um, and, and, and that particular year was a really dark one, yeah. And why, what did you hear from other Egyptians who were not Islamists about what that, what was going on? People were not sympathetic, you know, I mean, and you know, I think this was part of the problem with the, the Arab Spring is there was a cycle of violence, public violence that sort of people became desensitized to. Um, in that, you know, I remember in 2014 when I covered the anniversary, the third anniversary, I 
was caught up in a protest where the police drove everybody out with un unbelievable force, no warning, nothing. I mean, I broke two bones in my foot. The guy I was talking to also broke his foot running the other direction. The, you know, 60 people were killed that day, and it hardly made the papers. You know, nobody would care because this had been happening so often. So I mean, it was just kind of, you know, I, I think people just got desensitized to it. Um, but it really does make you think about structures because the odd thing about Cairo is it's a very safe city. Um, people are incredibly hospitable. You know, one of the people I wrote about, Saeed, the garbage man in my neighborhood, lived in one of these areas that you would, I guess, call a slum. And But I could go there any hour, go there alone at night, never. And if the thought of getting robbed wouldn't cross my mind. It's much safer than an American city, um, you know, in, in, in a sort of a poor part of an American city. And people are incredibly hospitable to strangers. You know, you'd, you'd see this over and over. Um, but it was interesting to me that that did not translate into political decency. You need something else, you know, people need some kind of structure, some sort of, you know, uh, parties and, you know, there needs to be some regulation of political action, otherwise it just becomes a fight. As um, General Sisi came on the scene, I remember this conversation I had early on when I was running out to talk with protesters that had so impressed me, and I talked to this very educated uh, Cairo gentleman who said, you know, maybe what will come out of this revolution is we'll have a new military general who will take the helm. And I thought, gosh, he, he doesn't know what's going on. Look at these revolutionaries. They're, they're incredible. But it turned out Sisi was the guy who came along and just got tremendous support in, in the beginning. And just, it was, a, it was another sort of second revolution that ushered him into power. Yeah, no, I mean, I, and I don't, I'm not convinced that was his plan all along. I mean, I think that, you know, events sort of pushed him in this direction that he saw himself as a person, and, and I don't think it was a combination of those things. Um, but it's it's a pattern, you know, it was a very familiar pattern, and it's, it's the, it is the pattern that they had followed for, you know, half a century, so it's not surprising. And did you see people, you were there until 2016, did you see people start to have a sense of, buyer's remorse, maybe this CC guy is... They had buyer's remorse about the revolution itself. So the buyer's remorse was throwing out Mubarak. You would hear this often, not among the, the real elite, but among, very common among the people, just have people you meet on the street, that we shouldn't have overthrown Mubarak, that was, it was a mistake, and this has all been a waste. We don't need this kind of movement, we need stability, so, you know, but I didn't really feel like people were turning on CC. I don't think they have, you know. I, not, not yet. No, no, I don't, I don't. I don't think they've turned on him. I think, you know, there are certainly elements that don't like him, but I think the average Egyptian does not want to see political unrest, and uh, they, they're happy to go back to the way the country was. Because there was a time when the revolution was everywhere. There were advertisements on TV, sort of these patriotic, like outpouring, posters and T-shirts and flags and everything. This was, and this was for what a uh, good more than a year, a couple of years. Yeah, no, I mean, it, you know, it was exciting, and this is a country where more than fit, more than half the population is 25 or under, you know, so it's a very young population. But, you know, ideas can come and go quickly, you know, and, and uh, it's, hard, again, hard to get traction, especially if people don't have jobs, people don't have good educations. Um, you know, the, 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 the parts of the system that made a revolution necessary also make it hard to sustain a revolution. Another part of the book, and it's uh, alluded to in the archaeology uh, of, the, of the subtitle here, you went and spent time talking to archaeologists, visiting all these digs. Um, I remember at the time thinking, I, well, I don't have time to do that. There's this revolution to cover. Um, but you learned things about the country that were enduring, and you make some interesting parallels. Yeah, no, I, I enjoyed doing that for a lot of reasons. I mean, one, it's, it's something that I had always been interested in. I'll, I'll show some images from this. Um, but uh, it was sort of just a personal interest. But I do feel like, uh, yeah, so I've always felt like archaeology is not just about the past. It's also about the present. There's a lot of, you know, ex exchange between the past and the present. Part of this is because we tend to view the past in our own image, that's a natural thing. But it's also, I think, because there are patterns of human behavior that recur, and all of the archaeologists would talk about this, and say, you know, the human mind has not changed dramatically from 3000 BC when the Egyptian state was established. And we might want to think it has, but it really hasn't. And, and you see a lot of this stuff, and the, the Egyptians were a very sophisticated political 
thinkers and, and the way that they structured their state, the way that they structured propaganda was all very recognizable. You, know, you have a figure like Akhenaten who would have these military parades, you know, with the bodyguards alongside, and it's just like the military parades that dictators have now. Um, he would have scenes where he's on his balcony, and you know, they see these in tombs, and he's throwing gifts down and talking to the people, like you know, like Hitler and in, in, in the Heldenplatz or whatever, you know. And, and it's, you know, the the, the one of the archaeologists who studied him said it's like in it's like an un, uh, unintentional caricature of modern dictators. You know, it's, it's very recognizable. So, and I love going to the south, up what's called Upper Egypt is all the way from Cairo down to the, the southern part of the country. It's, that's a pharaonic phrase, upper, you know, going by the, the Nile. Um, and so going to these areas and watching these digs was really dramatic. And, and one reason I liked it was simply because, as you said, nobody was doing it. Journalists weren't really asking, so you could get all kinds of access to sites. Um, their interest projects were going on all the time. This one, actually, they were doing an archaeology of looting that had happened during the revolution, because when the revolution happened, these sites, the, the police fled basically, and the police disappeared, and people came in and dug all over some of these key sites. This is one called Abydos, and then a year later, the archaeologists came to look and to try to track what the looters had damaged and what they had done, just so it would be recorded. And so they built this big ladder so they could photograph these pits. And so there, it was sort of a very uh, evocative um, thing, of, uh, you know, image of tracking the uh, the revolution. But I also I think the ideas of ancient Egypt were really fascinating. Um, I'm going to read a little bit here. From, let's see. Ancient Egyptians had words for two different kinds of time, jet and nehet. These terms cannot be translated into English, and it may be impossible for them to be grasped by the modern mind. In our world, time is a straight line, and one event leads to another. The accumulation of these events and the actions of the people who matter are what make history. But for ancient Egyptians, time was not linear, and events, hepera, were suspect. They were oddities, distractions. They interrupted the world's natural order. History did not exist as we would define it. The Egyptians were writing by 3300 BC, and they were still writing in, 30, in 332 BC when they were conquered by Alexander the Great. But across those three millennia, they never produced anything that would be considered a work of history in the modern sense. Neha is the time of cycles. It's associated with the movement of the sun, the passage of the seasons, and the annual flood of the Nile. It repeats, it recurs, it renews. Jet, on the other hand, is time without motion. When a king dies, he passes into Jet, which is the time of the gods. Temples are in Jet, as are pyramids, mummies, and royal art. The term is sometimes translated as eternal, but it also describes a state of completion and perfection. Something in Jet time is finished, but not past. It exists forever in the present. So this, this sense of time, I thought, was very evocative and very powerful. And when I talked to an Egyptologist named Ray Johnson, his idea was always that this was created by this landscape. You know, one of the amazing things, and one of the reasons I went to the south, is the place where you can see that's the cradle of Egyptian civilization. And it's this amazing thing, because you get about a tenth of an inch of rainfall every year. Um, but you have this incredible fertile valley, because the river flows through it. And it's very narrow. You know, this is a little hazy, but basically to here, is the other side of this gorge. And you have the green in the middle, and you've got 30 million people living there uh, along this strip of green, like just like an oasis that's really thin. And, and this sort of barrier was probably what created this sense of time. That permanent jet time is the desert. Nothing changes. There's no life there. And Neha, the cycles, is the river valley, where the river floods every year, the crops come and go. Um, and that sense of cycles was a really powerful thing as we watch these political cycles as well. Um, you know, and to me it sort of informed my perspective on the country. I also liked going to these sites because it was peaceful. You see the images of Tahrir, it's very intense. You can get tunnel vision. Um, you can become totally lost in this moment. And I found that going to the archaeological sites periodically helped me kind of back off a bit and think more and get a different perspective. You know, it was also just incredibly engaging and, and you know, nobody was going to these places. I, I described it 
you know, we we bought a car and we would drive all we drove all over the country with the girls and we you know when I went to this the Red Pyramid we you know they'd park there like you're going to somebody's house. There's not another car in the lot. You go up there, the guy's like half asleep. He's so bored. He doesn't even go into the pyramid with you. you go in alone. I had all these pictures of us at these totally abandoned sites of the girls. You know, like these are places that used to be just thronged with people and we would go and they would just have it to themselves. And it was an amazing experience. Um, it's always <laughs> completely empty. That's the one that inspired Ozymandias, you know, and it's it's really Shelley's poem. And it's amazing to go there when there's nobody there. Um, and they were all like this. It's at the Colossi of Memnon. And you always have these little, you know, these little girls are somewhere and they're wandering around. Yeah, so, so that was all, some of it was just, it was so beautiful. And, and you know, this sense of solitude was a way of surviving, I think, the political events for me as well as, as a writer and trying to think about them and put them in perspective. Get it into the microphone, that'll be more efficient. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm just wondering if the sense of uh, cycling time that you found in Egypt um, reminded you of the Chinese idea of uh, cycling time, seasonal, and what have you. I mean, I realize that the concept of jet seems pretty Egyptian, but Mm -hmm. The cycling of time yeah. is something very important. There's a, a timeline that I found in a Chinese shop, which is like a big spiral, which is we would never have a timeline like that in the West, and, and they had created this sort of amazing image. And you know, I think this is often traditional cultures had this sense more of cycles, and we sort of get away with it because we're obsessed with progress and we think that we're going in a certain direction. Um, and I think sometimes it's very healthy to temper that and to, to, to realize that this this image of the cycle um, may describe a lot of what we experience and what we see. Um, so, you know, that's one of the reasons why I don't ever feel like this is just dead stuff. And some people think it's totally irrelevant, you know, to, to study things like this, but I think it is. We go on a straight line, but some people think that things are getting better and better, and other people think, think things are getting worse and worse. Yeah, no, it's how you perceive it. But, but it is useful to remember that sometimes, you know, for many, for longer than we've been doing this straight line thing, people have been thinking in circles, you know. Thank you for coming out tonight. I read your books about China and it um, was very helpful. You made me feel like I was there when I went to China. I really got a sense of I can understand the culture, the economy uh, better. And uh, I can ask you if you can make a parallel between like, having small kids living there for five years, your experience with the medical system in uh, China, in the US, and in Egypt. And so a question about the medical system. Um, as someone with kids in China, <clears throat> Egypt, and the U.S. Yeah, well, we never had kids in China yet. We're moving back there this year. Um, but, you know, when I first went to China, the medical system wasn't very good. And so when I was in the Peace Corps, it was something that scared us a bit, you know. And, I mean, one of my students died, I think, in a way that was not necessary. She was in the hospital, and we went there, and there this. They didn't, you know, students were carrying bags of blood around, helping them. I mean, it seemed very chaotic, and things like that happened. I think it's improved a lot in China. Um, in Egypt, it really did concern us, to be honest. I mean, this was, we always hoped that we did not have medical problems, but we did, you always do, you know. And actually, both of our kids were bitten by rats while they were sleeping the first year that we were there. Um, we were in a ground floor apartment, and, and we took it to the doctor, and the doctor was like, oh, that's an insect bite. It doesn't look like an insect. It's got like incisors on it, you know, it's bloody. And I sent it to somebody in, in the U.S. I'm like, yeah, that's a rodent. It's either going to be a rat or a bat or something. And so we got a new pediatrician and we got a cat. Um, that was, and that's, you have to do that. That's all you can do sometimes, you know. And so, but yeah, I mean, if something serious happened, I mean, it really did concern you. I mean, when I broke my foot, I went to, it hurt a lot. Um, and I kind of, somebody finally allowed me to sort of get out because the police were sort of sweeping everybody into vans and you don't want that to happen. And so I, somebody finally let me hide in their place. And then I stumbled to a cab and I went to a doctor and they took the x-rays like, oh, it's fine, It'll be, it's just a sprain. And you know, and I didn't feel like a sprain. So I got went on crutches for a month. And then when I went back to the States, I got an x-ray and they're like, yeah, you broke two bones. You know? <laughs> it's good that you didn't walk on it. So our experiences were pretty negative and one of the characters I write about closely in this book sort of illustrates that in a very tragic way. Um, I 
think I'd like to be a tourist in Egypt, but uh, I don't know. Is it a good time to go now, or would it be better to wait? Or? Yeah, no, I actually think that it's uh, it's fine for tourism. And it actually was pretty much throughout. It, I think it's a hard place to live in a lot of ways. A hard place to be a journalist, especially during this era. That was dangerous. I never felt the danger in day-to-day -day life, like our neighborhood was not dangerous. Um, and they, there has not been a pattern of targeting tourists the way there was in the 1990s, like in 97. One of those images you saw of my daughters at the Temple of Hatshepsut where they massacred, there's a third of people, right? I can't remember the number, but this was 1997. That has not been a new, that, has, that was not repeated. So I actually think it's a great time to go as a tourist because it's not crowded. And the Chinese started coming. When I first went there, they never saw Chinese. By the end, that's, most of the tourists were Chinese. You go to the museum, all I heard was Chinese because they knew it was a bargain. It was cheap and, and, and they liked their antiquity. Uh, what's your call? Oh, okay. um, I was interested in your talking about the, the lack of institutional consciousness and organizational consciousness that, and the way that that kind of put a lid on the impulse the revolutionary impulse, if I could put it that way. But I'm wondering if, if underneath there's an impetus that is simply repressed at the moment, not only suppressed, but repressed, which is likely to turn up again soonish. Or do you think that there's, there's a thrust that is going to return soon? Yeah, I mean, my instinct is that I don't expect it to return soon. Um, I do. You know, I, f I feel like Cairo, Egypt is sort of unusual in the degree of self-organization and lack of institutional structure. Like in Cairo, you know, your, your capital city, 65% of the residents live in illegal neighborhoods that are totally unplanned, that are and not built to code. They just, people build stuff and they, then the government goes in and puts, you know, they, they connect to the water, you know, the water lines, they connect to electricity, and then the government goes and puts a meter on it. You know, that's, they have no control over it. There's no attempt to do that. It's, it's just, it's incredible. I mean, when I wrote about one of these neighbors because my garbage man lived in one of them, and the government had built a big highway that went right through the neighborhood, this access road called the Ring Road, and uh, they didn't give any, they just tried to pretend that these places don't exist. So there were no you know, exit ramps, entrance ramps in this neighborhood, which are called Ashwaiya, that's the word they used for it. The train line went through, the trains didn't stop. It's just like, they're just doing their own thing. You go there, you never see a cop. There's no policing, there's nobody in uniform, there's no government services. It's amazingly functional. These places are not slums in the sense of shanty towns like you would have in, in some other countries, because they're really built for permanence. You know, it tends to be brick, Almost everybody has electricity, running water. It's like 90, more than 94% have sewage services. So it's amazing at some level. And the things they would do, like, so and during one of the intense periods of the revolution, they organized, the people, there's a mosque in that neighborhood, organized the construction of an exit ramp. And an ex, and an on, and, you know, two major highway ramps. They did this themselves. <laughs> they raised some money, they built it, and it was totally illegal. <laughs> and, and, you know, and then, like by the time I left, there were eight more of them in, in, along this stretch of road. People, and most of them were dirt, but theirs was actually pretty well built, you know. And so, at some level, like you're very impressed by this, you, but you wish it could be harnessed. And I think that what happens is, and it's funny because this is one thing the archaeologists talked about. Because one of the sites I went to was a site of Amarna, which was an ancient capital that was built from scratch. Thirty thousand, thirty thousand people moved to this place because this king off and out and had the idea that he wanted a new capital. And when they looked at, because you can look at how the whole thing was laid out, and it was almost the same way as Cairo. It's like the vast majority. They put in some main government buildings, some main streets, so that the pharaoh could have his parade through town. Everything else was self-organized, and they, and he brought in like a modern um, development expert from the University of Westminster in, in, in London, and he's like, yeah, this is the same thing that people do now in Ashwaya or in places where slums are very prevalent and self-organized. It's, it's, it's an old pattern, you know, it's amazing. And so I, I think that, in my opinion, this lack of structure, it gives you, you kind of reach a ceiling with it, you know, and, and you need something else before you can, like, build up political, you know, political institutions. You know, they're really good at solving immediate problems, um, in the, getting the neighborhood to work right there, but in terms of an overall plan, that, that takes something different. 
So. And the need for, for stability is greater right now, in your view, than the need for change. Their desire. Yeah, the need is something else, but the desire that people have, the desire for stability runs very deep. Um, and the other side, the other component to this question of the revolution is, in my view, it was pretty narrowly political. It wasn't really a social revolution. And these were the things that I thought people should really be focusing on. I mean, the status of women, you know, 23% of women work. It's one of the lowest rates of female labor participation in, in the world. Even by regional standards, it's low even by the standards of the Middle East. Um, you know, you have only 5% of families where the women are the primary breadwinner. The young, you know, more than 50% of the population is 25 or younger, but they have incredibly low status, they have low educational opportunities, low work opportunities. You know, these are the groups that needed to be focused on, and nothing about the revolution really pointed in that direction. It's kind of funny, you had two organizations fighting it out, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Army. Neither of them have any women. And they had, couldn't care less about young people. All the people in the guidance bureau of the, of the, uh, you know, of the Muslim Brotherhood are like 70, 65 or old. They're all old men, and everybody in the leadership of the, you know, the army is all men. And the young people are just conscripts, of cannon fodder, you know. And so it's really it was very striking to me that this is how that battle played out. This is a little weird, but you are at Harvard. Ninety percent of the best squash players in the world are all Egyptian right now. Yeah. Why? <laughs> uh, you know, maybe being in a box, I don't know. I, I don't know what, I mean, squash is just one of these sports where you can probably build up a, you know, a program pretty easily, relatively easily. You couldn't do that with basketball, um, you know, because there's more participation in basketball than there is in squash worldwide. I never looked into that, but it is true. There's amazing. I guess I've heard that Hasan Mubarak was, is, Grew up playing squash. Yeah, maybe in one yeah club. I'm sure there's a story to it. Clubs. Yeah, I, but it's not a story I know. Of, unfortunately, it's a, that's a good story for your next visit. Yeah. yeah. Um, anybody next? Uh, I'm wondering if there's any investment in the literacy rates, and if not, is it in part to maintain the status quo? Um, I don't think there's any deliberate attempt to keep people uneducated. Um, but it's just, you know, lack of organization. Um, I mean, there were like, I have this in my book, I think it's five or six ministers of education during the five years that I was there. I mean, they're just cycling them through, and the whole government's like this, so nobody's getting traction. The funding is, you know, is a big issue. You know, the country was in serious financial problems. You also have had, a, for years now, the middle classes, basically anybody who's middle class and up is sending their children to private schools to be educated primarily in French or English. Many of these schools are actually not very good, so they kind of end up not with a really strong literary language of any sort, but many Egyptians now have poor literary Arabic, partly as a result of this. So that it's a huge, huge problem, and it, it was not a focus of the revolution, and it's only gotten worse. You know? I mean, this, and this is true of a lot of the, the sad, the tra one of the tragedies of the revolution is that many of these social problems were exacerbated. If you look at the status of women, Women's working rates dropped because people were afraid of having their young women out if, if there's political instability, and the birth rate went up since the revolution started because more women are staying home, and when they stay home, they have children. Um, one, one thing I read about Egypt under Barak is that a majority of Egyptians were getting subsidized food, subsidized bread. And I think the Muslim Brotherhood, with the reason they were popular with the broad base is because they were providing food and medical charity. Um, what, is, what was the situation after the revolution? Is that still going on? Is there still a lot of food charity given up? Yeah, I mean, the bread subsidy is a big deal. Um, that's been a standard government project. They subsidize fuel. They subsidize electricity. I mean, about a quarter of the budget goes to these subsidies. Um, and in terms of the Brotherhood, I always my conclusion was that that was greatly exaggerated, actually, um, in that I tried to do systematic studies of what the Brotherhood were doing in certain areas where I would look at their structures and, because they would tell you this, yeah, we were popular because we've always provided service, so I would go to a district and say, okay, what are your structures here? Do you have an office? I'd say, actually, I started in a governor, at, it's like a state, and I started at the capital and went down through the township to the, to the village levels to see if they had offices, and it didn't. It only went to the first level, and they were lying at every level about what was below them. 
Um, and I really started to wonder. And then I, when I, whenever I tried to look for their charity activities, I found them to be non-existent or, or barely there. And they, they had a lot of giveaways around elections. They would give away cooking oil and stuff on the you know days before the election. But it wasn't systematic um, and in institutionalized. So I thought that the you know to me the Brotherhood was sort of this Wizard of Oz type thing where it was it had this image and this aura of influence and support and it wasn't really there but they bought into it as well they could, they could turn people out for a protest they were very good at certain things um and one of the former brotherhood one of the smartest former Brotherhood members i talked to told me he's like they're really good at elections and that's it um they're very good at getting people out for elections and again this is partly because nobody else was good at it you know it's it's low it's weak competition versus you know strong you know, strength. You know, it's, it's, so you can think of the revolution the same way. I, I described how the Chinese saw the revolution. The Westerners looked at this and they said, this is a powerful social movement, a powerful revolution. The Chinese, who I knew in Egypt, who I got to know very well, said this is just a weak state that collapsed. And I think they were probably right. You know, it was basically a, a state that, you know, regime had become brittle, had become brittle. Mubarak had no successor in line. Um, and so the future was unclear, and, and the whole thing was weak enough that it toppled. It wasn't so much because there was a coherent, strong movement, even though we, we wanted to see it that way. You're going back to China? Yeah, and we're going back to China in August. We're moving back. Our plan was always to be in Egypt for five years. Um, and then write our books. We, we have a home in Colorado, um, and then we'll go back to China in August, probably for another four or five years. So we sort of wanted to do that while our kids are still young enough that they don't complain too much. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also part of for your children. Uh, yeah, we we want them to learn Chinese. Yeah, we want them to learn Chinese, um, and you know, they, because, which they haven't learned yet. It's, so far, it's the language we speak, and we don't want them to understand. <laughs> so we're going to lose that. We're, I, or that we could do Arabic, um, because they, they, they've already forgotten most of their Arabic, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so where do your kids go to school? Yeah, no, we, so they went to so many schools. Um, they were at a little, or, they were at a, a preschool in our neighborhood, and then we sent them to the Cairo British School which had zero British students. And then they went to the Cairo Irish School, which had zero Irish students. Um, and then they went to the Ridgeway Elementary in Colorado, which the, when the moment we enrolled them, the minority population went up by 20% in, in the, whole, the whole school. Um, so this was a really, it's a small town. There was one class per grade. You know, it's a rural part of Colorado. But they, you know, I don't know, they're flexible. I think twins kind of do their own, they sort of create their own, uh, environment in a way, and they're very good at transitions maybe. I think we're, we're probably lucky in that, especially identical twins. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they, they sort of handled all of this very, very well. And they're not, they're not intimidated by going to China, actually. They're, you know, they, they're talk about they're gonna miss their friends, but they're also eager to learn things, to learn Chinese, and so, uh, yeah, I think we're lucky with that. Any final ones? Do you have any final stories you wanna leave us with? Ah, oh, sorry, one more. As your books get like publicity in China, do you feel like moving to China in August will become a problem in some way because of your presence will be noted rather than like in fully you were like a stranger to lots of people that you can uh -huh. equate it to? Yeah, no, I have published three books in China, and yeah, it's, I mean, they my books actually sell more there than they do here. Um, <laughs> and, you know, but I don't think it's going to be a problem. Um, at all, uh, you know, I, I think, but I don't know for sure, I guess. Um, in terms of like, the, China is different now than when I left. You know, it is, it's, in, it's hit a more conservative phase, things are more controlled. Um, so it's, it's, it'll, you know, we'll have to learn it again. You know, we'll learn what this new place is. It's not the same as the place we left entirely. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very curious to see what it feels like after all these years out and after Egypt. If China was the kind of topic of the time in the 90s and the, some of the noughties, right, during the industrialization, the Middle East question is certainly the one of the present, right? And that whole cultural clash, the whole um, what's happening in the Middle East, the Islamic question, mm -hmm. if you like, from a cultural perspective. 
how do you see that playing out based on your on the ground observations now in the region? And then if you contrast that against the dialogue here today in the Western world, is that fair? Is it exaggerated? Well, I, I don't know. I, I guess I feel like our the view of the, these issues, like sort of like what I said about the Muslim Brotherhood, it always comes down to Islam, basically. Um, and Islamophobia is very intense. I mean, I did some reporting on Trump supporters in rural Colorado um, during the year of the election and afterward in 2016, and I was always struck by actually, you know, like this, these were place, places that had a fair number of immigrants from South America and from Mexico, and there were, I didn't hear a lot of racist comments about those people, but I heard a lot of racist comments about Muslims. Um, and they were six hours from a mosque. You know, I mean, there were no Muslims in the community. But people would talk about the Muslim Brotherhood. You know, I mean, this is a really intense thing, I think, in America. And so, you know, I think it's just, you have to take a, you look at the problems in the region and so much of it can be traced to colonialism and the way these places reacted to colonialism. Look at Egypt as, it's sort of an amazing place because they had this pharaonic history and it's the first place that sort of defined itself as a nation, basically. But then from like 300 BC, until 1952, there was not a single Egyptian king or pharaoh or ruler until Mohammed Nagib. Can you believe that? From three third, this people they invented the idea of a king basically, and and from three, three you know, third, fourth century BC to 1952, not a single Egyptian ran that country. There were Turks. I mean, there were there were Albanian. You know, you look at Muhammad Ali is Albanian, right? He's not Egyptian. Cleopatra is not Egyptian. Macedonia, you know, so it's, it's, you know, it's amazing. You need to, well, this has got to have an impact on a place, right? I mean, it's no mystery. Um, so it's, it's, it creates very long-lasting and complicated problems. But I think some people are just like, oh, it's Islam, you know, it's outdated, and you know, that's the problem. And it's not that simple. Maybe one last question. Okay. Does comment on how the visa process was, like, especially as a family? And the visa process? Yeah, and how it compared between... Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, because... Actually, one thing we were told before we went was that if you have different names, you might have problems renewing a visa. If your the husband and wife have different names, and and you know my wife is Leslie Chang, um, and actually we have not married legally. You know we consider ourselves married. We just we're not that into ceremonies, so we didn't do a wedding and all this stuff. And so the actually the day before we flew to Cairo, we got married. Um, <laughs> The kids were, you know, we left the kids with the sitter and went to the local courthouse when we got married to somebody. We saw it, some, I guess Leslie saw online this might be a problem. And sure enough, like, during one of those chaotic early periods, there's all this stuff's going on all the time, and there's protests on Tahrir. I have to go renew our visas, and I go, I choose a day when there's no protest. Everything reeks of tear gas around Tahrir, and I go into the big government building, and I give the guy our passport, and he's like, where's your marriage certificate? Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, this is what you need at this time, you know. And so I, I went home and God was so happy we'd been married. And, you know, so, you know. But it is funny the things that they do, that the moments when the bureaucracy would kick in. Um, but generally, it wasn't complicated there. I didn't feel a lot of surveillance. I felt a lot of very incompetent surveillance. Um, you know, like when I would travel to Upper Egypt, I would drive by myself and they would have a guy like out in front of a hotel to watch me come out and he would always be asleep and I would just drive off and then he would start calling eventually. And, and so I always gave them my numbers so they could just do their police work by telephone and they would do that a lot. Like they would just call, where, where are you? And I said, oh, I'm here. And then I go, okay. And then and I'd be on the desert road driving back and they would call like every 10 minutes, where are you? I'm on, this, I'm on the, you know, Sahara, you know, Sahara, you know the, the, the Sahara road. When you, the, I'm not anywhere, it's in the middle of the desert. There's nothing here. I'm on the, on the you know, they, and they call 10 minutes later, I'm still in the desert, you know, it's, it's gonna take five hours, you know. It was really, you know, after having been under Chinese surveillance, I mean, it, it, it sometimes was hard to take seriously, but you did, there was also this lack of system. There was capacities for things to go badly wrong. And in 2016, Julia Regini, a Cambridge PhD student, doing research that was very mildly sensitive on labor unions, nothing that's threatening the state, disappeared and showed up again 10 days later, having been tortured repeatedly for days, and was killed. You know, and, and so this is not a top, no, nobody said, get this guy. Some, something went wrong. You know, so they, they, some miscommunication, I mean, this, this sort of thing, and that was actually one of the moments where we said, okay, let's start to make our transition, let's, let's plan, because I felt like 
even though generally you felt safe, there was a level of chaos and a lack of system that made me nervous as the security state was kind of reasserting itself. And in China, that wouldn't have happened. You know, um, you know the, the, the Chinese regime is brutal in a lot of ways, but it's pretty systematic. Generally, you know where the lines are. They have shifted the lines recently, definitely. And there are pockets like Xinjiang where terrible things are going on. Um, but generally, having a system even under authoritarianism is better than not having a system under authoritarianism because then you just don't know when something's going to go. And that's the way I kind of felt by the end. You know. um, can you talk about Leslie's work? Yeah, no, Leslie's, so, um, she's working on a book actually about Egyptian women workers. Um, she spent time in a couple of Egyptian factories and so somewhat similar to her China book but totally different because the issues are so totally different. Know, in these places. So, so, so both of us have these books that will be somewhat influenced by our experiences in China and having sort of come to a third culture like this. Um, and hers is much more oriented toward women. Mine, you know, it, it just it splits that way naturally because I mean I, I couldn't talk to women in the way that she could. I couldn't get access the way she could. And um, so most of my main characters are male. Um, but I think it'll be an interesting pair of books. You know, when they're when they're done to read them and see different different things that we're noticing. Yeah. Uh, I think we're, we're having a, we're going to do, rearrange a bit and then we can have some book signing here. Yeah, Definitely buy the book, it's excellent. I just finished it.